Uh, I have often prayed in pastoral prayers throughout the years is that during a particular worship service that people would leave the place feeling like and knowing that they have met with the living God and that he has met them there. And uh, that's especially true of the model prayer that we're going to go through today as we seek to uh, raise our spiritual intensity and our spiritual temperature in our own personal lives as well as in the life of our church uh, we are seeking to do that through prayer, and there is no more favorite prayer of mine to talk about than the, to talk about the tabernacle prayer that I want to go through today. And uh, I'm kind of an Old Testament geek, and so I like the tabernacle, and I like to look at it. There's so many new things that I find every time I go through and study it, and uh, there's even some new things that I've discovered over the past uh, several weeks that I'm kind of bringing into today's message uh, that have just been a part of what it means to kind of pray through uh, this particular tabernacle. Uh, but I also like to talk about the, the things that are examples of how spiritual intensity comes through prayer. So uh, back when I was in college, my second semester of freshman year, uh, we started a group that kind of organically just came together in our dorm. Uh, these guys that were roommates decided to, to begin it, and then they started to invite everybody on the floor, and then it, pretty soon it was everybody in the hall, and uh, we got, so we had a group of 15 to 20 guys that would gather at 11 p.m. every single night. Every single night. Didn't matter if it was Sunday, weekend, Saturday, all that. We always got together at 11 o'clock uh, every single day throughout that whole semester. And we would just, in that time, spend time in prayer. We would bring all these different requests, things we knew were going on on campus, uh, situations in our own lives, different things. We would bring them and we would pray. And there was a lot of times we prayed until about 1 a.m. And uh, I remember that semester also having 8 o'clock classes in the morning uh, after praying till 1 a.m. And uh, it was quite the, the situation of going through that. And, and during my college days, uh, I was kind of, uh, I went from, in high school, I was like the, the one who just did all the studying and all that kind of stuff that nobody knew about until the final day of school. And it's like, oh, there's the valedictorian and uh, that kind of a thing. And, uh, but when I got to college, I was like, yeah, I'm going to ditch the books for a little bit, and I'm going to enjoy myself. And so I was one of those that was a social butterfly, kind of went around, knew everybody, all that kind of thing, got involved with the sports and, and all those different things. But that particular semester, I actually made the dean's list. And uh, it, was, it was almost effortless. And I decided there was a formula that went to it. Because I found that there was that intentional prayer time that we had with that group in the dorm. And then that was also the one semester that I remember I didn't have a girlfriend. <laughs> and I figured must be those two things together created a situation where academics could do very well. Uh, and because the rest of the time it wasn't as, as great during my time there. But one of the things that I remember in particular from those days and those times of prayer was we actually saw God move in different ways on campus. Things that we would pray for the very next night we would get together and say, hey, this happened today. Isn't this so cool? And we just began to really see the, the fruit of all of those prayers coming in. And we would constantly talk about different ones that had been fulfilled over the time such that this group of guys was, we were wired in to be there every night at 11. We didn't miss a single night. And that's the kind of intensity spiritually that we want to see in our own lives, that we want to see in the life of our church, because that's when God begins to move and we see the places where we meet get shaken and uh, all of those things that, like we've talked about in the last couple of weeks. And so we're going to go through this tabernacle prayer today, and one of the things I love about this prayer is it's all about getting to the presence of God. And that theme that's there of being able to say that we have met with the living God today comes when we practice this tabernacle prayer. And so I want to take you through it this morning. If you want to put that thing up on the screen that uh, has got the little diagram of it so you can see. Uh, so this is the Old Testament tabernacle. Uh, and we're going to go through the, the different pieces that are there. And what's really neat about this is there are seven kind of stations or seven little markers that we go through as we're praying this prayer. And seven, as you know, in the Bible is a perfect number. It's the number of holiness. It's the number of maturity and completeness. Uh, it's the number of God. And so uh, we're going to find a lot of sevens in here as we go through this. So you have at the one end where there's the purple uh, little curtains here in the outside courtyard. That's the entrance. And we're going to stop at the entrance as we go through this uh, prayer. 
And then we're also going to go inside and we're going to stop at the brazen altar, uh, which is where they offer the sacrifices on. From there, we'll go to the wash basin. And then we'll go into the holy place where we'll see the golden lampstand, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. And then we'll finally make the stop in the, the very holy of holies, as it was called. And uh, we'll see the Ark of the Covenant there with its mercy seat cover on it. And we'll go through each of these. And as we do, you're also going to find a connection with a New Testament event that is there. And the New Testament event is that in the Gospel of John, Jesus has seven statements that he makes that are I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the vine. You are the branches. I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you'll find that every one of these pieces corresponds to an I am statement of Jesus. And what's really cool about this prayer then is that as you pray, you are praying in the Holy Spirit because as believers we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We are praying to God the Father as we're seeking out his presence, getting into that most holy place. And at the same time, Jesus is going to walk with us through this as well. So we're praying with the Trinity all together in this one place, such that we're really going to be praying in the presence of God. And so we're going to think about that as we go through this. But I want to take them a little step at a time here, all these different pieces to this model prayer. So we're going to start at the entrance. We get to the entrance, and there's several things about the entrance that are important. So we get into the, this place where we're bringing the offering. And all the Israelites who are camped around, you can see the tents around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the center of their community. It was the center of their life. Everything revolved around the tabernacle and God's presence. And they would bring their sacrifices. Usually it was a sacrifice to be offered for some type of sin. Now, there was one type of offering that was a fellowship or a thank offering where they were just simply wanting to praise the Lord with an offering. Uh, but in other times, it was usually for some sin they had committed. And that becomes important for the entrance because the entrance is on the east side of the tabernacle. And if you read in the scriptures and you read particularly the Old Testament, every time there is movement to the east, there is movement away from God. So when we deal in Genesis chapter 3, and Adam and Eve, they have their temptation that they fall into, they sin, and they are sent out of the garden. And it says there that God puts cherubim in front of the garden with the sword to protect it so that they can't go back in and eat from the tree of life. And those cherubim, it says, are put on the east side of the garden to guard it because they've gone out the east. They've gone away from God. And then when we get to the story of Cain and Abel, uh, it says that Cain is punished and he's, he's sent out. He goes and he lives east of Eden. Uh, he's moving further to the east. And then as you read in those early chapters of Genesis, you get to the place of chapter 11 where it says the people have migrated even further east to the plain of Shinar where they build the Tower of Babel up to God because they want to try to be like God or reach God in some way. And all throughout Scripture you have this movement towards the east for the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And then we have chapter 12 of Genesis where it says Abraham is called by God to leave his people in Ur of the Chaldees, which was on that plain of Shinar, and to make his way back to the west, to the promised land of God, where the presence of God would dwell. And so as we go through this tabernacle prayer and as we pray through it, we're praying ourselves towards the presence of God, but we have to start in the place of the east, this place where our sin is. And this is the prayer where we, we're part of the prayer where we start out with confession. This is where we come to God and we simply lay down all of the things that we have that we know in our lives are not in right relationship with him. We might say, Lord, I need you to clean my mind right now because I've had some thoughts that are not pure in the way that you would want them to be. Lord, I need you to clean my attitude right now because there are people I have bitterness towards that needs to be laid aside and put under your care and under your blood. Lord, there are things that are uh, ways that I've treated my neighbor in a way that's, that's not the way that I should be treating them, and I confess that to you. This is all about confession at this place. And what's really neat about this, too, is in the encampment that's around that particular tabernacle, God arranged all of the 12 tribes, three on each side, and he sent a leading tribe to each side as well. And the leading tribe on the east side where we begin this journey through the tabernacle is the tribe of Judah from which Jesus comes. 
And we see there Jesus' fulfillment and picture of what Jesus says or what it says about Jesus in the New Testament, that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become his righteousness as we move to the west side in this prayer. And so he is there at that moment where we're, while we're confessing, saying, I'm taking it from you. I am taking the sin that you have. I'm putting it on myself. I'm becoming sin so that you can become righteous. And we also hear the words of Jesus there where he said, I am the gate for the sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the gate. Whoever believes in me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. That's the promise that we have at the gate. When we confess, Jesus gives us freedom. He takes that burden away from us, and we are able to come in and go out freely, and we don't have to carry that burden anymore. And that's the first stop on this tabernacle prayer. Well, then we get inside, and we get to the brazen altar. This is where the sacrifices were actually put on to be burned. So that worshiper who would bring their sacrifice would place their hands on the head of the animal, transferring their sin to the animal, and then the animal would have its throat slit. It would be put up on the uh, brazen altar where it would be offered before God, and it would go up as a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, it's interesting. What part of the prayer is this about? This is about the part of the prayer that we say to God, we're thankful for the things that he has done. Because here we are reminded of the words of Jesus, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he does it there on that altar of sacrifice. And we think of what Jesus has done for us, and we begin to pray those prayers. Jesus, I'm so glad that you died for me because you freed me from this in my life that I don't have to deal with the consequences of anymore. Jesus, I'm thankful that you made creation the way that you did. I got to see the sunrise today, and it was beautiful, Jesus. Thank you for doing that. And we can go on with our list of things that we are so thankful for that God has done in our life. And that's what we do at that second stage of the prayer as we remember Jesus as the good shepherd. And then we go to the wash basin. This is where the priests would wash themselves before entering the holy place, making sure that they were completely cleansed. You know, this wash basin was built in a, in a peculiar way. At the very bottom of the wash basin, there were mirrors such that when the priest went to bathe himself, he could see his own reflection and see where the dirt was on himself and the places that needed to be cleaned as he would be there washing at that basin. The second thing about the basin that was interesting is that it was said that it, there was eaves that were around the tabernacle proper, and those eaves uh, flowed into that wash basin such that all of the water that was there was placed there by God and not carried there by humans. So it was God's washing that they were receiving at that particular time. What's interesting also is that this wash basin reminds us of the practice of baptism and the idea that we have these moments where we are put under the water and raised back to, to new life symbolically in that baptism. It's here we kind of remember the words of Jesus that he told Martha just before raising Lazarus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. When they die to themselves, they will live eternally. And we're reminded of that as we pray at the wash basin, that God has, has died that we might live, and we want to live fully, and we want to be cleansed. And so here's the part of the prayer we, where we might start with the top of our head and go to the bottom of our feet, and we pray all these different things that we want to surrender to the Lord. We might say to him, Lord, would you cleanse my mind? May I only have pure thoughts. May I only have those thoughts that are praiseworthy and lovely and everything else that it says in Philippians 4.8. May that be what I think about. Would you cleanse me in that area today? Lord, would you cleanse my mouth? Sometimes there are words that come out of it that are not nice or kind in some way. Would you clean up those words so that they come out with just praises for you, encouragement to other people, truth that needs to be spoken. Lord, would you do that? Also, Lord, this is... Uh, this mouth of mine is where things go into my body. Lord, would you watch over that all clean things would go into my mouth and that nothing would come into it that would be unclean. And we can go on all the way to our heart, to, to every part of us, and say, Lord, I am here surrendered before you. Take all of my life and use it as you see fit. And we pray that at that stage of the prayer. That's the third 
stage that we do. And then we go into that holy place. And the first thing that should catch our attention there is the golden lampstand, not because it's gold, but because it's giving off light. Because the way this tabernacle was constructed, it was pitch black dark in there if you didn't have a light. Uh, it was made of really dark colored uh, skins and, and animal hairs and so forth, uh, such that it was it, without light in there, you would not be able to see two feet in front of you. But the golden lampstand is there to bring the flame and the fire of the light to expose everything that's in the darkness. And here we are reminded of Jesus' words that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And it's also we get the image here that the flames that are part of that light that was there on the golden lampstand remind us of the Holy Spirit. They remind us of the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when it says flames of fire came down and rested on each one of them and they began to declare the word of God boldly and they saw crowds of people coming around hearing them in their own languages and giving their hearts to Jesus in that particular moment. That was the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the place in the prayer where we ask for that same spiritual power that the Holy Spirit gives to rest within us. And we just simply call on the Holy Spirit to do His work in us. Because the Holy Spirit does a couple of things. The Holy Spirit gives us the fruits of the Spirit. We start to produce the fruit in our life when we call upon the Holy Spirit to work in us. We start to show more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All those things start to become much more evident in our lives when we pray for the Holy Spirit to work in power in and through us. But the other thing is, is that when we ask for the Holy Spirit's power, He also takes those gifts that He has given us. At the moment that the Holy Spirit comes in us, we have been given certain spiritual gifts. It might be the gift of teaching, the gift of administration, the gift of preaching, the gift of evangelism, the gift of mercy, the gift of hospitality or craftsmanship. Any number of those 25 or so gifts that are mentioned in the Scripture are given by the Spirit in that moment. And so when we're praying at this part of the prayer, we're asking, Holy Spirit, would you just so fill me that I might produce the fruit that demonstrate whose I am to the rest of the world and also that you would elevate the use of the gifts that you have given me so that I might help build your kingdom in the here and now. That's the fourth stage of our prayer. The fifth stage goes to the table of showbread. As we go there, we are reminded of the practice of communion because on that table was kept 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Every single day, a new fresh loaf, set of loaves were, were put there on that communion table. This is the place of provision. Oftentimes that bread was called the bread of the presence in the Old Testament as well. This is where we have that sense that God is providing for us. This is the place where we bring him our needs, the things that are truly upon our hearts that we need more than anything else. We might say to him, Lord, I'm, I'm in need today of affirmation. I've been beaten down this week and I, I'm just needing your encouragement to come in my life. We might be praying the words, Lord, I have this physical ailment in my body where I am just hurting and broken right now. I need your healing in this part of, of me. Lord, there are bills that are stacking up, and I, I need your provision for those bills. Would you please provide in your goodness? Here is also the place at the table of showbread where we might even uh, rest in God's promises, where we take our Bibles with us and we say, here's a promise from God that I want to claim today. And I just want to meditate on this for a moment. It might be something like Philippians 4.19 where it says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And there we might be able to claim that promise and say, God, I know that you'll meet my needs. It promises me in Scripture. You have promised that you will do that for me. And I'm just calling on that promise now and asking, Lord, that you would just fill me in this moment. This is the place where we pray for need. Then we go to the altar of incense. The altar of incense, incense representing the prayers of people going up continually before God. That's where it often has the imagery of throughout Scripture. And this is the place where we are just preparing to go into the most holy place. The high priest, when he would go into the most holy place, would come to this altar of incense and he would create an extra fire so that there would be smoke that would cover over the most holy place so that he could go in without the fear of death. 
And so he would do that at that particular point in time. But one of the things about this altar of incense is it's a time, too, as you're thinking about getting ready to go into the presence of God, you're reflecting on who he is. Before we had a time in the prayer where we reflected on what he's done for us, here is where we reflect on who he actually is. When we just simply say, Lord, you're, you're almighty. You are so powerful. I am thankful for your power because your power is what makes the difference in people's lives. Your power is what makes the difference in this world. Your power has the ability to change the whole circumstances of things that are going on. And Lord, I'm just thankful for your power. Lord, I'm thankful for your love. I'm thankful that you forgave me. I'm thankful that you have just uh, showered me with blessings beyond my comprehension and beyond what even I deserve. And we just have these moments where we rest in that prayer of looking at God and saying, wow, this is who you are. And and you want to get to know me. This is crazy. And we think about that and we just take time to meditate on that in there before we get into the actual place of his presence. And we're reminded here at this spot that Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Everything that was part of that incense concoction that it was very specific in the Old Testament were things that came from the natural world that were picked like flowers or uh, different kinds of, of plants that were put into this mixture to make the incense. And every one of them came from a vine. And it's just here that Jesus reminds us, I'm the vine, I'm the one you need to stay connected to. And if you're connected to me, you will bear much fruit in your life. In the final stage of this prayer, we get into that most holy place. There where the Ark of the Covenant is that represents the presence of God himself, and on top of it, the mercy seat with a cherubim over top of it, looking down at the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments and the jar of manna and Aaron's budded staff. All reminders of who God is. And it's here as we find ourselves in God's presence. If you've ever been in God's presence, you know there is nothing like it. If you've ever had one of those spiritually uh, just mind-blowing moments, uh, maybe you traveled down to Asbury during the revival, or maybe you've been in the midst of a revival before, maybe you've been somewhere where you just knew the Spirit of God was moving, and you have been in His presence. There is nothing like it. And this part of the prayer is meant for us to be in that place in our own prayer closet with our own devotional time, being able to say, boy, I have really met with God today, and he met me here. And one of the things that we do when we get to that place is we also are reminded because of that mercy seat cover, that is where the blood was applied once a year at the sacrifice of atonement that covered the sins of all the people of the nation. And we're reminded of God's mercy. And I think when we're in the presence of God and we're experiencing how lovely that is and we realize that that's really what the goal of, of salvation in heaven is, it isn't about pearly gates and golden streets and a mansion on a hillside and all those different things that we love to sing about and talk about, but it's about being in the presence of Almighty God. That's what eternity is going to be so mind-blowing and so amazing to us about is because we have no idea. Uh, you know, like the songwriter says, I can only imagine what that day will be like. We can't even fathom it. But when we get there and we see the mercy seat and the blood applied, it should also draw our attention to all of those people who are apart from God, whose souls right now are in jeopardy. And it should lead us in the prayer of this tabernacle prayer to begin to intercede on their behalf. Because there is nothing like being in the presence of God and we would want everybody that we know to be there. And we want to pray for those that are, are lost. We just want to take the time to lift them up. And we say, Lord, please be with that family member who doesn't know you, who needs to come to faith in you. I just lift them up to you. Lord, be with that coworker I have, maybe the one that annoys me to death, but I know they need Jesus. Lord, would you do a new work in them, and would you uh, begin to do something in their life that I couldn't even imagine? Lord, would you get to my neighbor My neighbor doesn't know you. Would you just bring them to to you? Lord, would you reveal yourself to my friend? I have a friend that doesn't know you, and they need to know you. Maybe it's even, Lord, I have this enemy, this person who just 
drives me nuts. But I know they need to know Jesus. And I want to lift them to you right now. And as we sit there in the presence of God and we're in that most holy place and we're interceding on behalf of others, that should be the place where we want to linger the longest because we just want to be there with him. And at the same time, we're seeing the world the way he sees it. We're seeing all of those out there who need to know him. You know, as we think about this prayer and we think about this whole process, the other thing that's just so amazing is to think about the New Testament you know, in the Old Testament days, the priest was the only one who could go into the presence of God, the high priest, and that was only once a year. Access to God was very limited at that time. But on crucifixion day, when Jesus hung on that cross and he breathed his last breath, it says that the, the curtain in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place where the presence of God was, was torn in two from top to bottom. And it was as if God, in his subtle yet very loud way, was saying, you're invited. You're invited to come in here. No longer is access restricted. The access is for everyone who will come through the gate, who will believe in the Good Shepherd, who believes that there is resurrection and life to be had, believes that he is the light of the world, the bread of life, the vine, and the way, the truth, and the life, such that no one can come to the Father and be in his presence except through Jesus. But there he said, Jesus has done it. You're invited. No longer any restriction. No longer is the place that would ever get too crowded. There's always a place for you. There in the presence of God. Boy, if you start praying this tabernacle prayer a little bit, I think things would change. I think you would be changed. I know I'm changed when I pray it. I think our church would be changed. I think our community would be changed. If we found ourselves in the presence of God far more often than we do right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. Even in the Old Testament, in the early days, the average person couldn't just pray to you. They had to go to that priest and they had to say, would you please make intercession for me? And they would be kind of left helpless that way. But Lord, you opened the door through your son, Jesus Christ, and you, you opened a way that we can come and, and just speak to you boldly right at your throne of grace and there find help for our time of trouble and need. And Lord, you've given us so many different models of who you are and how we can come into your presence. And Lord, I pray that you would challenge hearts today to begin to pray this prayer, this outline, this model in their own lives, that they would confess their sins regularly, that they would sense what you have done in their life, that you would, they would realize that you have have taken the old self and you crucified it, that they might live new lives, that you can empower them through the Holy Spirit, provide for their needs, be the presence that they need, and that you can even work on behalf of them in the hearts of other people. Lord, would you help us to pray this with more renewed fervor in our lives and in our hearts, that we might raise the spiritual temperature of our own lives the life of our church, the intensity that we have around you. Lord, would you just do a new work through your people praying this day. We pray this through Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Would you guys stand as we sing?